All right, we are going to get started now. I think most people have signed in. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to another virtual lecture with the Niagara the Lake Museum. I'm Amy Clausen, the Director of Finance and Marketing here at the museum, and today we are welcoming our very own Sarah Kaufman, who's the Managing Director and Curator here at the museum. And today, Sarah is going to highlight a part of our amazing collection with her talk, Opening the Curator's Treasure Chest, Exploring the War of 1812 Collection. Sarah has her master's in public history from Western and has been working in Niagara Museums for over 10 years. And she's been here in this position at the museum since 2010. I'm going to be monitoring the Q&A in the chat at the bottom of your window there. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to type them in there and then we'll uh, field them to Sarah at the end of the presentation. So Sarah, I'm gonna turn it over to you and take it away. Thank you, Amy. So this collection is very special to me. It was the very first one that I worked on when I came here on contract in 2009, actually. And I got a chance to work with a number of other collections in the Niagara region too. Um, and of course, this museum's uh, collection was my favorite. Um, so, you know, it was really big. I came just before the bicentennial came along in 2012. And, um, you know, I worked a ton with this collection. And then after the bicentennial, I basically shut the door on 1812 in a way, in a small way, whenever I could, because, uh, you know, we changed a lot of our exhibits to other topics and more domestic and less military stuff. Um, and so it was really nice to go through the collection, go through some of my old research and, um, and my exhibit text and such and pull out some of our favorite items. Now, I might be biased, but I really do genuinely think that uh, Niagara on Lake, we have the best collection of War of 1812 items. And so I've selected a few and some of the people that I noticed that signed up uh, are a bit familiar with our collection. They've either done research with it or um, have, you know, come to the exhibits a lot and such. Uh, on 1812 or, you know, uh, are on the collections committee. So they're familiar with the collection. And so if you see, don't see something that you remember from our collection, I apologize. I wanted to do more. I, even this morning, I had to start deleting some things because I think my talk was getting too long. I could talk a lot longer. And I had said to Amy, maybe I need to do a part two of this talk because I really, there's a lot of stuff here. So um, we'll try and get through a few of my favorite things uh, today. And um, hopefully you enjoy Enjoy it as much as I do. So just a little bit too about the collection. When the society first started uh, collecting a number of 1812 artifacts were among the first to be cataloged here and the collection took a very prominent display when Memorial Hall first opened in 1907. So you can imagine for the individuals that living around that time that uh, 1812 was a really big war. It was a big part of their history. Just like today, you know, the World Wars plays a significant role in a lot of the history that uh, you see in pop popular culture today. And it was a very historical uh, important event, especially with the centennial that came in 1912. So very soon around the time uh, after we were collecting, 1912 was coming up and the society was very focused on collecting relevant artifacts that would help to promote the national identity. And the big thing about the national identity around that time was its close connection with the British empire. So Janet, Carnahan, our first uh, president and curator, they were, and the society were very um, excited to start collecting War of 1812 treasures. So we'll start off, it's going to go for me. There we go. So the first item I wanted to bring to your attention is a proclamation that was issued in February of 1812. Now that's five months before the war is declared in June uh, of 1812. Now, actually, I should start off too and say this isn't going to be a full history lesson on the War of 1812. I'm hoping that you have a bit of background on 1812 because if I did a whole history, that's a whole nother lecture in itself um, as well. So, um, so this this proclamation was brought out five months before the War of 1812 broke out, and essentially, it is a warning to the residents of the area and those who hold authority about Americans coming across the river who might be trying to disturb the peace and create alliances before a war was to begin. So tensions between uh, Britain and the United States were growing. And a lot of people thought that recent loyalists to Upper Canada would uh, sympathize with the Americans and you know, welcome them with open arms if war was declared. And, and similar to the thought of Thomas Jefferson when he said uh, it would be a mere matter of marching, I, I think this document that Brock issued is showing that he shared the same sentiments that he thought, you know, 
uh, I, I'm a little concerned of what might happen if a war is declared, what these loyalists will do. So it's a very interesting document and we do have this up on our online collection. A lot of these are up online through our online database if you wanted to see them more. Another favorite piece of mine is a watercolor by an unknown artist of the Battle of Fort George, which happened in May of 1813. Um, it's based on a line drawing that was done in, uh, for the Philadelphia portfolio in 1817. And it's the Battle of Fort George. Uh, the Battle of Fort George is the start of the American occupation of Niagara during the war. And the drawing shows some details of our town. You can see the lighthouse, the couple of churches. You see uh, Fort George in the background there. Fort Niagara is across the river. And it shows the American forces who are all in the lake there and preparing for uh, their attack on the town of Niagara and Fort George. Now talking about the Battle of Fort George, we've got this beautiful piece that was done, uh, that is uh, Martin McClellan's wallet. So days before the Battle of Fort George, the wife of Captain McClellan, of the, he was part of the first Lincoln militia, which is our local militia that was here in, in Niagara and a few of the communities near us. Um, she found safety. She, they had a farm on John Street here in town and they found safety miles away in Virgil because they knew an attack was coming soon. And while visiting just before the Battle of Fort George, Martin told his wife that he didn't think that they, he would see he, his wife or her, their children again. And before he left, he decided to give her his watch and his pocketbook, which is what you see here, wallet, pocketbook. Um, and McClellan could see, you know, thousands of troops coming. And he thought, you know, this is sort of a token to my family and to my love because he knew what was coming. So as fog lifted at daybreak the following, um, a couple days later, McClellan saw 16 ships, 134 boats and scows, two miles from the town of Niagara out in the lake. And by nine o'clock, some around two, over 2,300 American soldiers started the land assault under the cover of heavy artillery. And the British defense was approximately 567 men, maybe a little bit more of regulars and militia that uh, were there to defend Fort George and the town. On the day of the battle, Martin was in line with the rest of his company facing the US forces. Oops, sorry. And um, he was only five to 10 meters away. And in the end, um, the British were forced to retreat. And Martin McClellan, unfortunately, was one of the, those who um, was killed in the Battle of Fort George. And so um, his family later donated this, this piece to our collection um, as a token of the memory of him. One of my second, another favorite piece that I have is our Niagara Library ledger. Now I apologize because I didn't, wasn't able to grab a, uh, the image that I wanted to grab, but this is the front page of the Niagara Library ledger. So the library ledger is from 1800 to 1820 and it contains names of local uh, individuals. It has annual meeting accounts, a catalog of, and a whole uh, list of the books that were taken out. There is probably about 827 volumes uh, that are available in the library in around 1812. Now, the interesting thing about this library ledger is that there's a little bit of a gap in 1813 that happens just uh, after the Battle of Fort George. And about a month after the Battle of Fort George, there's, there's a, um, a name of someone who signed up to you know, subscribe to get books out of the, the library. And his name is Captain Dorman. And at the end, it says U.S. So it was an American soldier who signed up to, to get library books for a three month membership in June of 1813. And it's very curious. And so the, it shows, you know, the library was perhaps still a bit active, maybe secretively. And it looks at, like at least maybe one soldier was looking to get involved with the, the occupied community and, and um, enjoyed getting books out of the library as well. Interesting enough, this piece was actually found in uh, the St. Andrew's Church attic by Janet Carnahan and she brought it into the collection. So this is a muster roll of a company of the 13th Regiment of the United States that was actually taken at Fort George. So um, it's a printed form muster roll of Captain Martin of the 13th Regiment, as I said, and it's from April 1813 to July 1813. 
and it has various details of the men who were present, um, any alterations since the last muster, the musicians, the corporals, the privates, the various names, and uh, whether they're absent, sick, or deserted. But the important thing is that it's taken at Fort George, which was the British fort, of course. So we know, you know that it was taken here during the American occupation. It's a really interesting research uh, piece. And um, I do love archival pieces. So um, you will see quite a few of those come up uh, in this talk. Next is our Laura Secord collection. Now, to my knowledge, there isn't another museum that has a Laura Secord, uh, actual artifacts from Laura Secord in their collection uh, like we do. So many of you know the story of Laura Secord in June of 1813. Uh, Laura Secord's home in Queenston is occupied by US soldiers. And one evening, she, her and her husband who was wounded at the Battle of Queenston Heights and he's convalescing at home still at that time, uh, overheard Americans plan, uh, their plan for attack on, about, on Beaver Dams. So the next morning, Laura sets out on her 32 kilometer trek to warn Fitzgibbon. Now the importance of her role is often debated by a number of historians, but regardless, Laura's strength and determination are certainly worth recognition. And her story begins to, uh, brings light to important uh, to the important role that women played in the War of 1812. Laura has since become a national hero. She's celebrated in theater and literature and even chocolates. And with the help of Emma Curry, who was one of our, um, one of the early authors of Laura Secord's story and actually a former resident of St. David's, um, with her help, Janet Carnahan was able to secure a number of items from, uh, that belonged to Laura Secord from her granddaughter, Augusta Smith. And the collection includes her trunk, a wood link necklace, a bowl, a kettle, a silverware with her initials LIS, which you can see in the corner there. I've got uh, some sugar tongs that show the LIS. So that's Laura Ingersoll Secord. And um, there's a quilt as well, the basket. Uh, the quilt, um, her granddaughter actually created it with textiles and pieces of embroidery that Laura, um, that Laura created. So we have a couple items that, um, you know, it was, it was not uncommon that uh, residents of Niagara would hide their prized possessions before or during the 1813 occupation time in order to prevent them from being confiscated by the American troops. So two of the items that you see here were donated to the museum with such a story. First is the officer's blanket that was owned by Colonel John Ball. And records state that it was used by Ball and Colonel Merritt to carry and hide British ammunition underground near St. David's. The second is a teapot that actually came in during the bicentennial time period from the Crooks family. They were descendants of James Crooks. And he, James Crooks, uh, if you don't know, what, he and his brothers were wealthy businessmen in Niagara who were involved in the shipping business. And the family had a property known as Crookston, which is now where Chautauqua area is. And it was also the site of the landing of the American troops during the Battle of Fort George. Uh, the family buried a number of items on their property on Crookston. And during the occupation period, this teapot was also one of the pieces um, from the family history that was buried on Crookston land. So we have a number of war loss claims in our collection as well. Following the war, many found their properties in disrespect, disrepair, and it was time for the town to rebuild. One of the first steps was to make a claim to the British government for stolen or damaged property. And the plundering that took place during the war was carried out by American, British, and native soldiers, everyone. In their detailed claims, many residents identified who it was exactly who stole their property or uh, damaged their property. And they estimated the value of everything even down to the candlesticks in hopes that the British government would compensate them. Unfortunately, not many were compensated, compensated and those that did receive payment only received a very small percentage of what their total claim was. So here are two examples. I know that they're really hard to read and I apologize, they are online. Um, but here are two examples. One is of Robert Thompson and another is of James Cooper of St. David's. 
And the items on their list, you can see the values along the side there, uh, especially of uh, Cooper's, which is on the right hand side there. They list uh, textiles, they detail their buildings and furniture and farming equipment. Some of the war loss claims that I've gone through are so detailed that you can almost imagine exactly what their homes looked like um, back then. Even uh, Dixon, which we don't have in our collection, but William Dixon had sketches done of his homes uh, to, so just to detail, to help with the detail of his claim. And for research sake, the museum transcribed local war loss claims for all of Niagara on Lake including the villages in the township during the bicentennial. So those, one, uh, that research, those transcriptions, which were done by Peter Babcock, uh, a lot of hard work on Peter's side. So thank you, Peter. Um, some of the information is in, uh, especially the Old Town Claims is on our website called niagaraeveofwar.ca, while others are held in our research files here at the museum. Again, Difficult to read, but I really wanted to talk about the Elizabeth Campbell collection because it's it's one of my favorite collections. Um, a number of women who were living in Niagara during the occupation had suffered significantly without the help of their husbands, and especially after their homes were burned in December of 1813. Both St. David's and Niagara were burned during during the War of 1812. So Elizabeth Campbell, who um, has written our is part of this collection here, it was the wife of Major, the Fort Major Campbell, who I'll talk about a little bit later because I have his coat, his uniform coat on, uh, in the talk. She was actually a single mom in 1813 and a series of documents that we have in our collection describe her experience during the burning. And she lived quite comfortably in a story and a half house, uh, story and a half high framed house at the corner of Johnson and Victoria. And the house was very well furnished. They had a barn, they had two acres of fruit trees and such. And as recounted in a letter, which I've copied here, she was quote, driven from her house with her three infants without the possibility of saving her own or their clothes and was with Miss, with, Mrs. William Dixon exposed for three days and nights upon the snow without with only the canopy of heaven for a covering. Her house, once the seat of hospitality and plenty, reduced to ashes before her face. A few valuables she had endeavored to save were torn from her by a monster in human form and carried off and divided. Her youngest child named Eleanor actually died of exposure on the way to find shelter outside of town. Many struggled during that harsh winter that followed and Elizabeth was left without support and in desperate need of essentials such as candles and fuel, which were both important for heat and light during the dark and cold winter months. She received a bit of compensation for her losses, about 63 pounds, which is significantly less than what she claimed, which was uh, 778 pounds. Unfortunately, there are very few firsthand accounts of the civilian experience of the burning of Newark, uh, Niagara by the American army. And you know, when studying conflicts that happened over 200 years ago, it can be difficult to look past the battles and the statistics to empathize with the realities of war. And I think Elizabeth's account exemplifies the civilian experience of the burning and provides a domestic and humanistic understanding of the War of 1812. Next up is Reverend Robert Addison's desk, the beautiful desk that we have on display. Some who lived outside of town were very fortunate not to have suffered the burning of Niagara and many in the township came to into town to help these people um, who were stranded in the cold. And Reverend Addison was one of those individuals. So in our collection, we're fortunate to have his black walnut desk. It survived the burning in December because it was kept in his home, which is called Lake Lodge. And it was situated out on the lake shore uh, outside of town. It still exists there today. And it would have been a notable feature in Addison's study. It was constantly used for sermons, you know, as he was preparing sermons and correspondence. And during the occupation period, just as a side note too, Addison was taken prisoner by the US Army, but was later paroled. And he actually continued to hold um, services and provide baptismal services in his home during the war. 
one of my favorite pieces, and we actually just received a donation of um, a colored print, almost the exact same image, but a colored piece, um, which we're very excited to, to add to the collection soon. Um, this print is of the lighthouse that was located at Mississauga Point, where Fort Mississauga is today. And Dominic Henry was a retired Royal Artillery gunner during the Revolutionary War, and he was the lighthouse keeper in Niagara from 1803 to 1814. Now, during the Battle of Fort George in May of 1813, the Henry family, along with other residents, were caught in the middle of the American attack. And during the bombardment, his wife, Mary, fearlessly provided nourishment and aid to the wounded of the battlefield. During the burning of Niagara, she also opened her home um, for any of the refugees because the lighthouse and the lighthouse keeper's home were not burned because it needed to be used for navigational purposes by the American and uh, British ships. Um, in both instances, Mary's selfless and brave efforts were undeniably saved lives and she received about 25 pounds from the Loyal and Patriotic Society of Upper Canada for all of her efforts. Talking about Mississauga Point, um, I have an image here of Fort Mississauga. It's, it's obviously a much later image, it's 1908 that's in our collection, but just to kind of give a visual of, of Fort Mississauga, if you're not from the area, you can of course Google it because the tower still exists. But I wanted to show uh, a piece in our collection. The sword featured here is believed to be the sword carried by a musician in Captain Runchy's, uh, Run Runchy's uh, Colored Corps of Volunteers during the War of 1812. And um, so this was a Black Corps um, where there was actually a couple of locals, the Waters family, Humphrey and James Waters um, were part of this Colored Corps. Um, they were very active in Niagara during the war. They, were, uh, they participated in the Battle of Queenston Heights and Fort George and in 1813 they were actually reassigned to assist the Royal Engineers so they ended up um, repairing a lot of British fortifications and they helped to build Fort Mississauga at the mouth of the Niagara River and we I have here in the corner there the original key to the gunpowder magazine uh, which is also in our collection. Okay, so this is one of my favorite pieces, one of the early pieces too that came out. You'll hear me say that a lot. There's a lot of favorite pieces. I'm, I'm, I have a hard time picking favorites, I guess. Um, so this unique document is the parole paper of Jacob Ball. So um, it's signed and dated in May of 1814. It includes his age, it includes height, complexion, hair, and eye color. So we can get an idea of what Jacob looked like. Now he was taken hostage by the American army and this parole is a declaration by him that he would not bear arms against the United States during the war. And he also wrote at the end that he would not act directly or indirectly in any way that might violate the privilege that he has received. Now Ball was a captain in the Lincoln militia and the men didn't always follow what promise they made, of course, to an enemy. So we have found out, we have found out, of course, Jacob ended up fighting when he was, after he was paroled, he came back across the, the river. He ended up fighting and dying in the Battle of Lundy's Lane in July of 1814, fighting alongside the British. So it's a very fascinating piece and a fascinating story about Jacob Ball. Trophies of war. So often uh, times, often during the times of war, there are prizes taken uh, from major victories or sometimes plunder and, and signs of, of surrender. So we have two items that were taken from the Americans during the War of 1812. The first is a silver uh, serving basket, which you see in the bottom corner there. It is engraved. This basket was taken from General Porter's tent in the War of 1812-14 and was given with other articles as loot to Major Fitzgerald of the 41st Regiment. The second is a very interesting piece. It is an American sword surrendered to the British Colonel Murray at the taking of Fort Niagara, December 19th, 1813. And um, this American officer's artillery sword is believed to have been surrendered by Captain Leonard of the U.S. Artillery Regiment and delivered to uh, Lieutenant Colonel John Murray of the 100th Regiment during the capture of Fort Niagara. So the, the capture of Fort Niagara happens, as I said, December 19th, 1813, which is it's essentially retaliation for what happened to Niagara at uh, the burning of Niagara, which was December 10th of 1813. 
so you'll see here a couple images of the sword. I tried to do some close-ups. You can see the American, um, the eagle on the pommel there of the sword and the ivory handle, the beautiful ivory handle and the etchings um, that are on the blade itself. There were a number, there are a number of newspapers in our collection, including a few of one that was called the War Newspaper. Um, and those include a lot of accounts of the War of 1812 from generals. Um, and there's even one called the Palladium, which I might be pronouncing that wrong, which expresses concern about the war and its effect on the American economy, talking about American business owners who didn't want the war to happen. Uh, because many of the businesses of those who, who were along the border relied on the cross-border trade as we do today, right? Uh, so they didn't want the war to happen. And featured here, and I'm sorry, it's very blurry, um, the York Gazette was printed in, uh, this is a, the copy of the York Gazette that was printed in October 24th, 1812. And the paper has various articles about the ongoing war, a letter found on an American officer during the Battle of Princeton Heights, it talks about uh, General Schaaf, who um, took over after Brock passed away at the Battle of Queenston Heights. And um, it actually gives a detailed description of Major General Brock and Lieutenant Colonel uh, McDonnell's funeral procession that happened on October 16th. So it contains a map, which you can kind of see here. Obviously, those shapes are the caskets, um, a map of, you know, who uh, was his pallbearers, who were the chief mourners. There's even a note about Brock's horse being there. Reverend Addison is, is on there too. It's really quite a fascinating piece and really gives an idea of what the funeral must have been like uh, following the Battle of Queenston Heights. So this Six Nations commemorative wreath, uh, which is dated 1912, it was created to commemorate the 100th anniversary of Major General Brock's death. Uh, the Council of Chiefs authorized the making of this leather wreath as an expression of loyalty to the British Crown in 1812 and 1912. There is a bear, which you can't, you can see it says Six Nations 1812, and then below it is a bear, which is really hard to see in pictures. Um, but uh, the bear is holding six arrows and it's a symbol of the Council of Chiefs and there's oak leaves that are around the, um, out, the outside of it. And those are a symbolism of the monarchy and loyalty with the monarchy. And this reef was used during the commemorative ceremonies at Brock's Monument in Queenston. Many of the speakers at this major event included politicians and local historians. And the Six Nations representatives that spoke there were Chief Alexander Hill and Chief A.G. Smith of the Grand River, who were also present at um, many of the events. And they promoted First Nations contributions and used this opportunity to call on the British government for political representation and equality for their people. And unfortunately, the cheers of the crowd did not translate into action for them uh, following the ceremonies. We do have a, a number of swords. I showed you one already, but I did want to point out this one. I had to cut a couple uh, this morning. Again, as I said for my talk, getting too long. Uh, James Muirhead sword is a, a beautiful piece here. During the War of 1812, uh, Dr. James Muirhead served as a surgeon to the flank companies and held the post of surgeon for the militia. He was also a pallbearer at Brock's funeral. He had an apothecary shop in his house on Prudhoe, which is, was near Regent Street. And when the, uh, when the Americans occupied the town, he remained at his house and continued his medical duties. He was taken prisoner at one point, uh, but he was paroled in January of 1814. And even though he lost almost everything when Niagara was burned, Muirhead would accept nothing from the Loyal and Patriotic Society um, for his services to the poor. It was a very um, interesting. So he died uh, in March of 1834, and he's actually buried at Butler's Burial Ground in Niagara on Lake, too. Um, I wanted to talk to you about McFarland's sword. So this sword was found in 1903 in the attic of McFarland House in Niagara on Lake. There's no markings on the blade whatsoever, but there is an older label that we think was probably placed on there by an early curator of uh, the museum. So um, during the second American invasion of Upper Canada, John McFarlane and his son were made prisoners and sent to Greenbush internment camp. 
near Albany and James escaped and scouted Fort Niagara on his return journey. So um, he became one of Colonel Murray's guides when um, there was the taking of Fort Niagara after the burning of, of Niagara in uh, December of 1813. So um, as the story goes, uh, James McFarland came, or John McFarland, sorry, came back to Niagara and found his brick house was badly damaged. Uh, and apparently, you know, was suffering a lot from his loss and eventually uh, died in um, late 1815. And he's buried at St. Mark's Church in Niagara. Okay, so here's another favorite piece of Sarah's. Um, so this is a Lincoln Militia Leave Pass. This is an extremely rare Art, um, archival piece. So during the summer and into the autumn of 1812, the small garrison that was here at Fort George relied a lot on the militiamen to help um, sort of augment their forces to defend against the American attacks. Militia volunteers were expected to serve longer periods. So normally the militia would get together, they would train, and then they would go back home. But now that war was looming, they were expecting the militia to stay a little bit longer. And one of the problems, of course, with that at the time was that a lot of the militiamen are farmers. They're constantly worried about their farms and uh, when they're away on active service and especially during planting and harvest season. So at Fort George, many of the militiamen uh, went absent and, you know, they would leave and travel home and take care of their farm and then they would actually end up coming back. So officially they were considered deserters, which was a very serious crime and uh, according to the British army and some could be court martialed or heavily fined if they had been found to go AWOL. But the other thing is that um, the British army relied on these men and their farms for nourishment, of course, to feed the British troops that were stationed at Fort George. So in order to control the situation, the British required militiamen on active duty to apply for a leave of absence, which would grant them the you know, permission to go back home. So what they would do if you didn't have this pass was that um, certain British forces or militia, and they even paid uh, bounty to native warriors who found anyone who, um, was part of the militia and hadn't reported to duty, they were home and they didn't have pass, they uh, would would take them in, they, they would get a bounty for um, taking them in uh, and reporting them to uh, the British officials. So it was very much in a man's favor to apply for a legitimate leave pass. Um, and it was often granted. I mean, this one in particular is dated um, October 26, 1812. So that's not too long after the Battle of Queenston Heights. There probably wasn't too much going on. Uh, there wasn't anything, no further trouble was really expected until the end of the year, you know. So, um, you know, the British, British felt it was probably pretty safe for this gentleman, which was um, Ebenezer Culver to head back home and to work on his farm. So this artifact, as I said, is a very rare example of such a passport. It's signed by Lieutenant Colonel William Kloss, who uh, was the Colonel of the first Lincoln uh, militia at the time. We have a number of uniforms in our collection, and this one in particular is the uniform of Fort Major Donald Campbell. I couldn't show all of our uniforms, unfortunately, I had to cut a couple, but uh, this one in particular is of Campbell. Now, I had spoke about Elizabeth Campbell previously. This is her husband's coat. So it's an early 1800 uniform coat, and as I mentioned, he was a Fort Major at uh, Fort George, which means he was essentially an administrator, administrative position. He didn't work directly with any regiment. He worked directly with the British Army. Um, he had a long and oh, I'm sorry. Um, he had a long and wine-ranging career. Sorry, I'm trying to mute it. There we go. I'm the only one in the museum today, so I'm sorry about that. Um, in his senior years, um, he the position of Fort Major would have been very attractive for uh, an older gentleman. And the coat is missing its collar and its lapels. There's also a silver epaulette that you can see uh, on the shoulder there, uh, but it's not known if this is original to his coat. There's also a false pocket on the back of the coat. And for, as Fort Major, Campbell would have worn a coat of um, one of his previous regiments likely, but none of his previous regiments had the blue facings with um, 
with the red coat. So it's more likely that he bought this coat from another officer or possibly had it made locally uh, in a generic British officer style. Um, as research has shown that there's no specific uniform requirement for his position at the time. He actually died of unknown causes in December of 1812 um, at the age of 57. So as I mentioned, Elizabeth Campbell was um, his wife and she was a single mom in 1813. He was buried um, at Fort George in one of the bast bastions there. And it's not, I'm not sure, it's not known if his burial site was disturbed during the, the reconstruction period of Fort George in the 1930s. Okay, here's another prized possession. This coat is amazing. It has an amazing story of Colonel uh, Daniel McDougall. So it was, he was a very distinguished veteran officer who served in the War of 1812, and then he moved here to Niagara on Lake following the conflict. When the war broke out, he was part of the Glengarry Militia, and he took part in several battles, uh, most notably the bloody battle of Lundy's Lane that happened in July of 1814. He was severely wounded at Lundy's Lane and he, lie, he was lying in the field after having been struck seven times and he was initially reported as mortally wounded. Although he recovered, McDougall had subsequent health problems. He still had a lead ball stuck in his um, body and he, he had that in his body for the rest of his life and he was in no shape to resume any of his duties uh, for many months after the Battle of Lundy's Lane. And he was actually granted a small pension for, um, for his contributions. Now, the museum actually holds a number of archival documents related to McDougall. We have medical reports and affidavits related to his request for financial assistance because of course he was unable to, do, to perform many jobs following the War of 1812. Uh, in reality, McDougall is very lucky to have survived uh, the Battle of Lundy's Lane. Medicine was very crude at the time and he lived with a lead bullet, uh, ball, musket ball in his leg for, for several years, but he did live a very active life in the town of Niagara. So, you know, this, this coat was donated to the museum almost a century ago, and it was said to be one, the one that he wore when he was wounded at, um, during the Battle of Lundy's Lane. You can see there's quite you know, a bit of damage on, on, on the, um, the uniform there. And garments like this in, in, in this history are very rare. And the fact that it was made locally, it was likely made locally, that's what the research uh, has shown, and survived all this time largely unaltered is even more amazing. It's really quite a beautiful coat with, with a great story. The next coat is the uniform coat that belonged to Inna Shaw of the 1st Regiment of the Lincoln Militia. The coat likely predates uh, the War of 1812, but soldiers would have several coats available uh, to them depending on their situation. Now, Shaw was originally a part of the Queen's Rangers, which uh, was uh, a unit that Lieutenant Governor John Graves Simcoe commanded during the American Revolution. And he was later given a permanent rank in the British Army. He originally settled in New Brunswick after the revolution, but then was pulled to Niagara by Simcoe and served as a member of the Executive Council from 1794 to 1807. And during the War of 1812, he was the Major General of the Militia. So he was responsible for the training of the local militias leading up to the War of 1812. And he sadly died in York uh, in February of 1814. I have an image here. Now that's not the coat that we have on display. I just wanted to show you, this is a 1902 artist rendering of Shaw, just to give you an idea of what he looks like. And it's held at the Archives on Terran. Now the next coat, Major General Sir Isaac Brock's coat. Just kidding, of course it's not ours, but it could have been, it could have been ours. There are two times that this coat could have come into our collection and I would love it. Now this is the Brock coat with of course the bullet hole, which you can see just under the, the lapel there, there's a little black mark there. Um, this, this is held at the War Museum, of course. But the first time that it could have come into our collection was with Janet Carnahan, um, as I mentioned, the first president and one of the early curators. Um, she lobbied the Brock family of Guernsey to send it here to Niagara on the Lake. And around the early 1900s, the family was returning his his stained coats, this one, as well as his dress uniform coat. Uh, but unfortunately, the Dominion Archives, as it was then known, um, wouldn't let that happen. And they stated that the family explicitly wanted it to stay in Ottawa. 
Sure. Uh, the second time was in 2012 when we had it on display for the Battle of Queenston Heights anniversary. And I worked my charm as hard as I could on behalf of the residents of Niagara on the Lake for them to leave the coat here because it was most fitting to be in our collection. Uh, and I, I tried uh, to hold my grip on the shipping container as much as I could, but unfortunately they were pretty persistent that it had to go back to Ottawa. It would be lovely to have it though. We were happy to have it on display for the anniversary of the Battle of Kingston Heights nonetheless. And the last item that I'll really talk, uh, focus on is Brock's hat. So we talked about his coat. Well, it was reunited with the hat briefly during the Battle of Kingston Heights anniversary uh, display. And this, this is Brock's hat. As I said, it's a felt hat with ostrich feathers. He ordered it because he needed a hat that was suitable for his rank of major general, but it did not reach Canada until after his death. A funny piece uh, in that he never actually wore the hat. Um, it never was on his head. He did, however, um, it did, however, um, it was placed on his casket for two of his four funeral processions. Uh, when the hat arrived in Niagara after Brock's death, a letter in our collection from donors stated that it was given to his nephew. Well, it was actually given to his cousin, Captain James Brock, who was stationed at Balls Falls with the 49th Regiment of Foot. Um, Balls Falls is, you know, they've got the Balls Conservation Area. I should look it up. It's a really beautiful place uh, and check it out. And upon leaving the mill, James gifted the hat to the property owner, who was George Ball, as a thank you for all of his hospitality while the 49th were staying there. George Ball later moved to Niagara and built the Locust Grove home on Hunter Road here. And when Brock's body was first moved from Fort George to the first Brock's monument in 1824, the hat was loaned for the procession. When the second monument was finished, the first of course was bombed by Benjamin Lett, um, it was borrowed again. And the family uh, was promised that it would be taken care of, but the Colonel in charge of the events allowed the hat to be handled and tried on by several people and it was returned damaged. The family states that it was loaned a third time when the Prince of Wales visited Brock's monument in 1860 and it was again subject to the same treatment. And the, finally, uh, the hat finally rested with the Historical Society in 1897. So it is one of our earliest artifacts that we've had uh, in our collection. And unfortunately, that's where I'm going to have to stop. But there is more, there's lots more. And, and I hope that maybe next time, maybe I'll be able to do a part two of our collection. You know, I just have a couple pictures here just to kind of show, you know, we do have cross belt plates of various regiments that were here, a gorget, and uh, lots of uh, muskets and brown bass being one of the most popular muskets, uh, a common India pattern design during the War of 1812. So there is more, and I wish that I had more time uh, to talk to you about other items but uh, I will leave it there and, and just uh, let you be excited for a future talk, perhaps. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'm going to open it up to questions. So if anyone has any questions they want to type in uh, the box there. I had a question um, that I always think about when I think about Brock's hat, in that a lot of artist depictions of War of 1812 battles with Brock, Battle of Queens and Heights, show him wearing a hat. So do you think that he would have had another hat on or is the hat just people thinking that he had a hat because there's a hat? <laughs> oh no, he definitely he definitely had other hats that he was wearing. So um, this hat that we have in our collection, he was major general of, um, of the army. So he wanted to order or have a hat made that was more um, you know, for his rank. And he actually had to order it from Britain and he had a really big head. And even when you look at um, his uniform, so there's his, his coat. He, and this is say a regular coat that we have, where is it? Like this one, this one probably wouldn't even fit me. And that one, and they're super small. So um, you, now look at how big Brock's is. So he was a big guy, he probably would, that coat would fit perhaps a, a, some males today. Um, he was a big guy and so he had a big head too, apparently, you know, probably realistically. And, figuratively as well. He's quite a, I think, an arrogant guy, but um, he had to order a hat from, from Britain in order to fit his head. So uh, yeah, he definitely would have had a hat on anyways before this. Yeah. 
Um, just a, a comment from Peter Mook about the engraved initials on the Laura Secord piece um, that it would have belonged to a later date, circa 1900. So that would have been something, um, one of her possessions, but not necessarily from the War of 1812 period. Um, and Adrienne Stevenson just mentioned that her uh, Reverend Robert Addison is one of her ancestors. So that's great. Oh, nice. <laughs> I know there are um, other Addison pieces out there. I, there's a few people who have Addison collections uh, who have notified me of items. So I know there's other stuff out there as well. Um, Suzanne Bear says, this is an amazing collection. I hope researchers know about it. Maybe you can talk a little bit about um, our experience with War of 1812 researchers. Yeah, I mean, during the War of 1812 Bicentennial, we, our numbers for researchers was huge. It was like 400, it was huge. Uh, normally we get about 200, let's say re request a year, let's say average. Um, we had tons of people and uh, a lot of people very interested in uh, uniforms. We've had a lot of our uniforms looked at by say Rene Chartrand, who's really, you know, he's probably one of the best people um, to look at at uniforms and to identify them. There's other items, you know, in our collection that I wish I could talk about more, but yeah, we've had um, people from the War Museum research, uh, from Fort Niagara come and do research here, uh, Parks Canada, and, and local research. A lot of family research is done here, but yeah, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, the collection was promoted, especially leading up to um, the War of 1812. That was actually one of my first jobs was to make sure that that collection got digitized. Um, so we, we are trying, we do try and promote it as much as possible. But yes, it, it is quite a collection and probably the best in the country. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Reynolds wants to know if the American officer returned the library book or is there a fine still outstanding for his, <laughs> his book? <laughs> Good question. Well, interesting enough. Uh, so I said there was probably about 800 books that were in the library beforehand and following. Uh, so when the library picked up more after the war, which really didn't happen probably until about 1816, I think is when it happens. There's only about 200 books. So a lot of the books um, were likely burned uh, during the war of 1812. And we have one book i think it's just one maybe two one book uh in particular that we have found that has the the book plate uh for the niagara library and is in the registry of their books that we have in our collection so it's amazing that the library ledger and this book even survived the burning of the town and andrew heron was the librarian the keeper at the time uh, who he somehow it must have been saved from by Heron or a relative of his family I'm not sure but as far as I know I don't well I don't know if it was returned so we'll have to talk to Kathy Simpson at the library and talk to her about some time. <laughs> um, Melanie Chittenden who joined us today uh, has a couple ancestors Shafe but also uh, the American general Van uh, Rens I can never say his name <laughs> Renslayer. Yeah. yeah that's a hard one. <laughs> so it's it's very interesting that we have uh, we have some genealogists here with us today. Awesome. So the you see Brock's coat, which it seems awful that I really pointed out Brock's coat, but the one lying down in front of him was Shafe's coat that came back to Canada as well during the bicentennial. Um, and there is, I believe, a Shafe chair out there in the world of. Um, collectors as well that came across into our collection as well but that coat that's lying down that's really decorative that's the dress uniform of Shafe uh, and I cannot recall where it went afterwards after being here briefly. Uh, Peter Mook wanted to know does the NHS want a Guernsey 10 pound banknote with Brock's portrait and an illustration of the Battle of Queens and Heights? <laughs> well we're always taking uh, donations our collections committee haven't uh, met in a little while of course because of the restrictions and trying to figure out how to do collections digitally uh, but Peter we're, we're definitely interested and I can bring that to the collections committee and uh, we can talk about it because I don't think we have anything like that in our collection so that would be really great. Uh, Serena wanted to know if the document image that's on the Facebook event page um, is that document actually signed by Brock and, or would it have been transcribed you, by someone else? I think you used a, a commission. So yeah. we do have a couple commissions in our collection, military uh, like appointments, commission documents in our collection that are actually signed by Brock. They are. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, Christopher Choi says you mentioned Butler's burial grounds. Are there any plans to refurbish it since it's in a state of disrepair? 
I know there was, it was brought to the town of Niagara on Lakes uh, attention and a committee was struck. Um, the committee met a couple of times, but unfortunately then uh, when we were discussing it, uh, COVID hit last March and there hasn't been any discussions at this time. It's owned by Parks Canada, so they would be the best person to talk to. I mean, um, you don't want to disturb the property too much. I know a lot of the stones were redone when Niagara Parks owned the property and, you know, there were new stones put in so people could read what was put on the stone, the original stones. I know the walkway up to it could really probably use some work, um, but the, those questions are probably best directed towards Parks Canada. And if you want, I can put you in contact with those people. Um, Judy said supposedly there were two homes not burned in 1813. Uh, where were they and what happened to them? Yes, yeah, so, um, and this is coming from Joy Armsby's research. So when I first started here, I worked a lot with Joy Armsby and uh, she's an amazing researcher. And her research found that two homes on Johnson Street were the ones that weren't burned. One was the, um, I'm forgetting the house now. It's a very well-known family. Um, oh, I can't remember Clench, what her name is. Clench? Clench House. Clench House. <laughs> Clench House. Um, it was one of them. Uh, and it burned, I think it was months later. And it was an accidental fire that was lit, I think, for, it's been a while since I've done this, Judy, so thanks for testing me. Um, lit for <laughs> laundry. Like they were heating up the water, I think, for laundry. And it was an accident and it burned down not long after that. Uh, so it was an accidental fire. And then the second home that survived was actually torn down by the town or by the town of Niagara on Lake in the early 1900s or a community person uh, because they, and they didn't know the history of that home. Now this is in in the old town area. Of course, there are homes outside of the old town area that survived. You know, there's McFarland's house and Fields house and Lake Lodge, of course that survived. But Joy also, when she was doing a lot of this research, uh, told me that she, you can go into the basement of some of the very early homes and see some of the old beams that have markings of the fire, because a lot of people would have rebuilt afterwards uh, on top of what was left, if anything was left. Now, a lot of the homes after uh, the burning, you know, they were in a lot of disrepair. They were actually, um, you know, a lot of homes were just flattened completely anyways um, by Americans or or later on by the British and the bricks and, and um, other supplies were used to build Fort Mississauga. Um, Karen Noonan wanted to know uh, if you know how many Americans had library memberships, for example, from Youngstown, New York, which I think Karen is from. Uh, uh, yes, she is. Um, <laughs> Mr. or Captain Dorman, it, uh, I think it was Cap. I can't remember what his name was there. Um, Dorman was the only name that was found there. So um, it's, you know, there's records going up to May of 1813, and then there's nothing. And then in June, there's just the one American who took a book out. And unfortunately, I haven't done research on this gentleman to find out who he is and even whether he's on that, uh, that muster roll that we have. Um, and then there's nothing else. There's nothing else until about any subscriptions, books being taken out until uh, the like 1816, 1815 time period. Um, and Gail Kerr wanted to know, uh, was the only time soldiers wore these coats during uh, like going into battle? Just wondering how often they may have been worn and replaced. Now, I'm not an expert on that in particular, but um, depend. I think a lot of it depends on the rank of the officers. So some officers had their dress uniforms, which were a lot more decorative and nice, and then they had their sort of like the regular use ones. Um, and likely, uh, you know, when they are a soldier and they're on duty, they're wearing um, their regular coats at all times. Um, and you know they wouldn't be dressing in civilian clothes. A lot of the British regulars who were here were here as British regulars. They weren't regular locals. Now the militiamen are different. Um, some of them, uh, some of the, the officers and such had red coats, but a lot of the regular men, uh, in which they had to purchase, um, a lot of the regular men didn't have red coats. They wore their regular clothing, of course, and um, had markings to identify themselves as, as militia. 
And then we'll end with Bruce Parker's question. Do you have plans to do part two of your presentation? I love that question. I would like to do a uh, part to. two. And I'm sure Amy will rope me in to do another one because I think I could show you a lot of more pieces that we have. If you are interested, as I said, a lot of it's up on our online collection. Um, so you can go and enjoy it. But I do love talking about the 1812 collection as a very spe special place in my heart because it was the first collection that I really did a lot of research on uh, when I first got here. So hopefully I'll, I'll do a part two. I know Amy after this will be like, let's book that date so we can get it. <laughs> um, so we will, because there's, as I said, there's a lot that I caught even this morning and you can see the time went pretty close to 45 minutes uh, with even after cutting lots. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for sharing the collection with us today, Sarah. We can obviously we can never have everything out on display at one time here at the museum. So it's nice to open up the vault and bring some things out that people haven't seen in a while. Um, if you want to support our lecture series, other programming and our collections, consider making a donation to the museum. A link is in the chat and we'll also put it on the YouTube recording uh, for anyone who wants to help support our programming here. Our next speaker is February 24th at 11 a.m. And we've got Scott Finley of Parks Canada who's going to present The First Cut is the Deepest, a look at medical practice in the army during the Regency period. So that one should be interesting. Please note that that talk will not be recorded. So you'll have to catch that one live. And hopefully we'll see you in two weeks. Enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Bye.